Amen. Uh, take your Bibles, if you would, please. If I can find mine. There we go. And turn to Mark chapter 16. Then we'll, we'll be in uh, Exodus chapter 12. So you might turn over there. Exodus chapter 12. Mark chapter 16 to start out with. We'll read the Easter story. Sun rises in the east. Jesus is coming from the east. Is rising. The sun rising is a picture of Christ rising. Amen. Mark chapter 16, <clears throat> verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, I'll tell you what, let's do. Stand, those of you who are here, those of you who are at home, you can stand also. I know it kind of might feel funny. Microphone. It's on. Huh? Okay, hang on. He sent me a message. Hang on here. Oh, it's called um, The Lamb in Your House. It's in the Sunday Sermons folder. Should be. All right. Mark chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall, roll us away, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. God answered their question, amen? And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, there ye shall see him. As he said unto you, Jesus fulfilled all of the scriptures pertaining to the cross, to the resurrection, including his own prophecy, that he would be slain, that he would lay in the grave three days, and he said it at the way Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And he said, then he shall rise from the dead. And they didn't understand what he was talking about. They didn't grasp that. And that's usually how it is with the scriptures. Sometimes it just takes a while for it to sink in. But when we see it happen, we go, this is that which was written by the prophets. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You pray for me. My blood sugar went down. That's why I had to walk out a while ago. Father in heaven, we come before you today. We thank you for Jesus Christ the victor over death, over hell, over the grave, over our sin, the captain of the host, the great high priest, the creator, I am that I am, is Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you sent your Son because you love us. We thank you, Jesus, that you came willingly, ready to do your Father's will, I can't fathom how difficult that must have been. I can't understand that. For you to leave heaven, to come down here, to be the scapegoat, the one that everybody blames, all of our sins and transgressions cast upon you who were innocent. That kind of love, Father, is hard for us to understand. But it's a love that a father has for his children. A love that a creator has for his creation. And a love that Jesus has for everybody in the world. Father, remind us, please, that, yeah, we 
understand there's some very evil people in this world. But so were we. Remind us, Father, that everybody that we see walking, everybody that we see driving, everybody we see on TV, everybody we see at work, everybody we pass by in the store, everybody who lives and everybody who dies, Jesus loved them enough to become sin for them, to take their sins on himself, and for no other reason than just pure love. Help us to understand that kind of love and help us to love people the way you love them. Being willing to give of ourselves, to sacrifice of ourselves, to sacrifice our time, sacrifice even our lives if need be, sacrifice our rights, our thoughts, our pride, our ego, for the sake and the benefit of others who may or may not ever return the favor, but that's not what love is about to begin with. Teach us that kind of love, and we thank you for that kind of Savior. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us still to have the day where we can celebrate his death, his resurrection. We thank you that he's the one bearing our petitions to you right now. We ask, Father, Lord, my prayer today is that someone is saved. Someone. doesn't matter who, and it doesn't have to be by my preaching. But that, God, you would save a sinner somewhere. A drug addict, a drunk, a whoremonger, a liar, someone full of pride, someone full of themselves. God, that you would change them, make them into your image, save them like you did us. We love you and we thank you, Lord, for saving us. Bless our service bless all of those around the world who hear the gospel preached this morning. May it sink into their hearts just what has been done for all of us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray in his name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, uh, if you would take your Bible, go to Exodus chapter 12. I asked the Lord what to preach this morning. And um, was looking at the Passover passage in the scriptures, which is what this is based on. The crucifixion of Christ was the fulfillment of the Passover. Paul tells us that Christ is our Passover. And um, I, I want to say this again. I'm very thankful that our belief and our religion and our doctrine... It's not based upon the idea that we must be present inside of a particular building in order to eat lamb or to eat a wafer and that our salvation is not dependent upon or God's grace to us is not dependent on our ability to come into his house to eat that particular lamb or eat that wafer. The Jews... At Passover, we'll eat lamb, still to this day. But I will say that their traditions have practically destroyed the real meaning behind what the Passover was all about. And they've invented a lot of things and thrown it, thrown it into their Passover seders that are not really in the Scriptures. And one of these days, I believe God's going to open some of their eyes and they're going to see that. The sad thing is that we have supposedly Christian pastors who are telling people the same thing that we must go back and try to keep the law try to keep the Passover and so they will adopt these Jewish traditions and these Jewish mythologies these Jewish fables they will adopt those into Christianity saying that we must do these things in order to please and to honor God excuse me there is only one that can please God and his name is not Mike Hoggard and it's not John Cooley, it's not Melissa, it's, his name is Jesus Christ. The only thing that pleases God and satisfies the demands of God was the one who was perfect before God and it wasn't anybody else in the Bible except Jesus Christ. And so I started thinking about the Passover and how the Lamb was present in practically everything they did at the Passover and the fact that we're not here eating lamb. 
We're not here partaking of a symbol of bread or a symbol of wine. We're here partaking of Jesus Christ himself through his word. Somebody say amen. In verse 3 of Exodus chapter 12, this was the law that God gave to Moses, speaking unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. And I want you to understand this. God is the one who provides the lamb. When Abraham was taking Isaac, I was going to put this in my notes, forgot all about it. When Abraham was taking Isaac in Genesis chapter 22 to Mount Moriah, literally the place where Jesus then was going to, 2,000 years later, was going to be sacrificed as the lamb. When Abraham was taking his only son, his beloved son, his only begotten son, when he was taking Isaac there to Mount Moriah to offer him up as a sacrifice, Isaac asked on the way, Father, we, we have the wood. Father, we have, we have the place. We're going to the place. We have everything that we need, but we don't have the lamb. We don't have the sacrifice. And Abraham, speaking by way of the Holy Ghost, said, and I love my King James Bible for the way it says it. It says it better than every other translation in the world. He said, Son, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice and God has done exactly that by providing himself to be the lamb the sacrifice in our place and I want you to understand what this lamb represents and what all the Old Testament sacrifices represent because if you understand that then you'll understand the cross a little bit animals don't sin there's no sin for them there's no law there's no commandments they operate purely by instinct or by training or by experience, but they are not capable of sin. They are innocent as far as God is concerned. However, man is made lower than the angels, but he's made above the animals. God gave us a conscience. God gave us a will. God gave us a choice to choose righteousness or to choose evil. And we all have chosen evil. We've all chosen all. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all chosen to do evil. So what God then does is he takes the punishment that should belong to us because of our sins and our transgressions. And he takes them. And every year at the Day of Atonement, the priest would then take his hands and lay it upon the, the animal's head, the goat's head, and discharge the sins of the nation of Israel to that goat's head. That was called the scapegoat. That's where we get that term from. The scapegoat then would bear the sins and the iniquities, the innocent taking on the sins of the wicked. The one who had done nothing wrong taking the sin. And he must be sacrificed. He must be killed. He must be destroyed instead of us. So it was a, and this is the idea of the substitutional atonement of Jesus Christ. He stood in our place, taking on our condemnation for us who had done no sin. He took on our sin to himself, bore them to the cross, took upon himself the lashes, took upon himself the punishment, took upon himself the sacrifice. Instead of that happening to us, somebody say amen. So the lamb was killed so that we could live. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it. Now notice this. The lamb of the first year used to be a firstborn lamb. He used to be a male. And he was to be without blemish blemish no spot no sores upon him nothing he shall be without blemish you should take it out from the sheep or from the goats you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening this is a again a foreshadowing to cross to the cross because even though Christ was hung on the cross in the morning he endured on the cross until the evening. And before the evening, he gave up the ghost. He said, it is finished. He gave up the ghost and he died 
shortly before the evening time. And the, and the killing of the lamb in the evening is a foreshadowing of Christ dying before the darkness came in. When we look in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, the Bible gives us then the explanation of what it is we're reading. It's telling us that this lamb that they killed back in the, in the days of the book of Exodus, the lamb that they killed was merely a shadow, merely a type, merely a, a ritual to be performed until the real lamb could be sacrificed. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12, the Bible says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Notice that phrase, for us. Underline that in your Bible. And when you get home today, or most of you that are here, those of you that are already home, look it up. Type in the phrase, for us. And I would suggest you look all through the New Testament for that and you will see that Christ did this for us. He was in our place taking on our sins for us. Somebody say amen. If God be for us, who can be against us? For if the blood of bulls, verse 13, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the pu purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, not the old. We're not killing a lamb. We're not eating lamb flesh here in this service. We not even uh, we're gonna we're gonna kind of hold off on our communion service until such a time as when we can gather back together again. That's what I'm gonna do, and I, I'm looking forward to that. Amen. We're gonna hold off on that. And again, I'm glad that my sanctification is not dependent on us having the ability to have that service. Amen. For this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. The Lamb of the Old Testament was a picture of the Lamb of the New Testament. So when we go back now and look at, at, at Exodus 12, just kind of keep your Bibles open there because we're going to go back to it. I want you to think of what this lamb represents. I want you to think that it represents Jesus Christ in all his glory and all of his merits and all of the things that he has done and all that he represents. That lamb is Christ. So when we, uh, John chapter, in fact, John, I looked this up. John is the only writer of the Bible who calls Jesus the lamb with a capital L. I did not know that until I looked this up. In fact, you'll find it. Watch this now. You'll find it in your Bible 28 times. Break that down mathematically. What is that number? Seven for perfection and completion times four for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Lamb with a capital L. And John, who is the fourth writer of the gospel, is the only one who wrote that in the Bible with a capital L. He wrote it two times in, in the book of John, or a few times in the book of John, but then rest of it is in the book of Revelation, 28 times. John 1, the next day when John seeth Jesus, this is John the Baptist he's talking about, coming unto him, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So think of that Lamb now that, that, that's in your house. And since we can't have church in the church house, we're restricted to having church in your house, you want a lamb in your house with you today. Somebody say amen. Do we not need a lamb in our house? Amen. So the lamb is there, number one, to take away our sins. John 1, 35, verse, uh, John chapter 1, verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the lamb of God. So now we understand what this lamb represents. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. And let's look and see what the lamb does. The purpose of the lamb. Could the Israelites have fulfilled what God wanted? Could the Israelites have been saved 
without the presence of the Lamb? The answer is absolutely no. God, who is no respect of persons, I believe if an Egyptian would have watched those Jews and said, you know what, I'm going to watch those Jews because we've suffered nine plagues and I think another one's coming and I'm going to watch what those Jews do and I'm going to do what those Jews do and whatever the Jews do, that's what I'm going to do. And maybe, maybe I'll, get, I'll get through this night. Whatever this next plague is coming, I think I'm going to follow the Jews. I believe that if an Egyptian would have done that, God would have saved him. Because that destroying spirit was looking for one thing only. And it wasn't, it wasn't a crucifix. It wasn't a, a, an idol of some kind, a Virgin Mary. It wasn't anything like that. He was looking for the presence of the blood. Somebody say amen. Exodus 12, verse 5. And by the way, I'll say this. If there was a Jew who did not do this, God would not save them simply because they are Jews. God is no respecter of persons. He demands and insists that salvation, His salvation, be by grace through faith alone and nothing else. Somebody say amen. So it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Egyptian, white or black, brown or yellow, green, purple, whatever. Doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what religion you used to have. If you will follow Jesus by faith, if you will have the lamb in your house, God will save you. Your lamb shall, he said in verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. So he starts out on day one, they count through day seven, that's one week, they count through day 14, that's two weeks, two times seven is 14. So after the fulfillment of the 14 days, seven is the number for perfection, he said, verse seven, they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. This is what it looks like. The blood on the door post. That was their protection. He said in verse 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when, listen to this, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Somebody say amen. That's where we get that song. When I see, we should have sang that one. I had a little trouble. My blood, I could tell my blood sugar was taking a nosedive during that second song. And I'm going... What chords, what are those strange looking marks on that paper? I get to where I can't think sometimes. Like father, like son. Right, mama? Amen. So anyway, the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes from. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. I want to tell you something. You can have a religion... You can have all the emblems of that religion. You can go to church. You can eat a wafer. You can drink their drink. You can go to a Passover cedar and eat a lamb and drink bitter herbs. You can do all of that stuff and none of that stuff will save you. None of those things will save you. I don't care if you do them perfectly. They will not save you. It must be the blood of the lamb that saves you. That is your protection. Verse 22, same chapter. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood. Where was hyssop used in the crucifixion scene? You remember what they did? They put a sponge on the end of a hyssop and put that to Jesus' mouth. And what did he do? It was bitter. It was vinegar. Who drinks? You ever drink vinegar, Roy? No. Uh, I bet you, that's why I was asking you. I bet you did try to. He said, I tried to. Just didn't get the buzz out of it, right? Couldn't hardly choke it down. Amen. They gave Christ vinegar. You know what that was? He's tasting the bitterness of death for every man. Whew. That's good. Christ knows the bitterness Sister Olivia, if you're watching, our Savior knows the bitterness, how death tastes. He 
He took that willingly. Did it so that he would have compassion on us who mourn those who die. Somebody say amen. You shall take the bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin. On the day of atonement, the high priest was to take a hyssop, dip it in the blood, go into the most holy place, and sprinkle it on the ark, on the north side of the ark, seven times for perfection, completion, forgiveness of sins. That's what the number seven represents. Dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side post, the top. And both sides, it makes a cross with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Listen, the world will beckon us to walk out. Won't it? The world will, will pull at us to get us to go out of the house. If we go out of the house, people, we're going to die. Think about the situation we're in right now. They're telling us the potential for you going out of your house being around people, you'll catch this virus and you'll die. Now it's real. But anyway, he said, none of you shall go out the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses and smite you. Who's already had the destroyer come into their house a time or two before? Amen. I've had... Things destroyed out of my life that were precious to me. And it's because of sin. When God takes people from us, we recognize that the sting of death is sin. But if God sees the blood, the blood of the Lamb... He will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses. The destroyer is the Antichrist, by the way. This is, this is not just fulfilled at Calvary. This is a prophecy of the last times. The destroyer is coming to this world to destroy. Abaddon, Apollyon is what he's called in Revelation 9, verse 11. The lamb in your house, look at verse 8 of Exodus chapter 12. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire. Now, I'm going to ask you a question again. Think, just think, think logically here. If they were to smite the blood and put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, but then not eat the lamb, are they going to be saved? See, God put this all together as one package. He, told, he did not say, now, if you do part of this, that's fine. If you don't do all of it, that's fine. No. If you're going to obey God, you obey God. If you're, going to, if you're going to trust God, then do what God said. Noah built the whole ark. He didn't leave off one side of it. What good does one side left off do? On a boat. It'll sink. Well, I got everything done except the bottom. Do you think we need it? Well, we put the blood out there. I went to church last week. That ought to be good enough between me and God. No. God said, eat the lamb. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head, his head with his legs and with the pertinence, that means his bowels, his guts, all of his organs thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And it's a fire sacrifice. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Christ represents, when he's on the cross, he's representing all of the enemies that are against us. You remember in Revelation chapter 13, we don't just have one beast, we have two. We have one that's seven heads and ten horns. But we have another one that comes up out of the earth, and he has, he has what on his head? Two horns like a lamb. That's what this symbol is. People's going to go, oh, Mike Cogger made that symbol. But that's what that is. It's the, the lamb horns of the false prophet. And what happens to the false prophet and all of those who follow him? 
They're cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. That's what this is. That's why he said all of it is to be burnt with fire. Now think of, think of the lies of the devil and think of your sins now. What he's doing here in that lamb, since that lamb has taken on the sins, God said, I'm not just going to destroy part of your sins. I'm going to destroy all of your sins. Somebody say amen. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I've had lamb. It's pretty good. It's a delicacy in some places. But he's talking about eating the lamb. What does that mean? Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. So I had to leave a while ago and go put something in my belly so I, my mind would have light. Sugar brings light to our mind. So now I can think clearly. John chapter 6, turn there. Here's what Jesus said about this. He said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Now was he talking about the Catholic Mass? Absolutely not. That is food sacrificed to idols as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not putting that in my mouth. Amen. Not touching it. If any man will eat of this bread, he shall live forever. What was he talking about? The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Now verse 58, here it is. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now think about what Jesus said when he was tempted in the wilderness. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So you think you can perform religious rituals and that will get you into heaven. You think that you can wear a crucifix that was blessed by the Pope and, you, and because of that you can have all your sins forgiven. That is a lie. That's a joke. He said, eat, the, eat my flesh and drink my blood. What was he referring to? He's talking about a steady diet of the Word of God. Eating it. Eating it means to partake of it. Your, your body eats by eating food. Your soul eats a different way. Your soul eats through your eyes and your ears. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. You want to be saved? You want God to save you? It takes the blood and it takes the lamb's flesh. Amen. The Word of God. Now, Exodus 12, verse 14. Here's what else the lamb is good for. The lamb is good for purging. When you have the lamb in your house, you ought to see my house right now. I'm not making this up. My wife has been sitting at home dreaming up things to do. I got up this morning, went to look for my cereal, opened the pantry door, and there's a big gaping hole where my cereal thing was. Where's all that food? And it was kind of dark in the kitchen. I turned around, looked, table's full of it. She's cleaning out the pantry. Anything that's dated 1978, we're not keeping. <laughs> Amen. Anything dated 1994, we're going to pitch. <laughs> Amen. You know how stuff gets in the back of the pantry, you don't know it's there, so you buy five more of it. So watch this. Exodus 12, verse 14. This day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord. My, I can just see my wife rolling her eyes going, I wish he would just move on. Throughout your generation, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. 
And in the first day, there shall be an holy convocation. In the seventh day, there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. What was he purging? He was purging leaven. Roy, what are they putting wine and beer to turn it into wine and beer? Yeast. I mean, you can drink grape juice that's been unyeasted all you want to. But adding just a little leaven to it, the yeast eats up the sugars that are in the grape juice and spits out alcohol. And it's no good. Amen? Well, I'm not saying it don't taste good. I'm just saying it's not good for you. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, he explains it. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Why were they to purge out the leaven out of their houses? Now remember, this is your house. You worry about your house today. Not what everybody else is doing. Not what Donald Trump is doing today. Not what everybody in the world is doing. Dr. Fauci, Fauci, Fauci. Not what the, the liberals are doing. Not what Bill Gates is doing. You worry about you today. Is there leaven in your house? Just a little bit. Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is, this is why we don't have a Passover Seder. Christ is it. Christ is our Passover sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Malice and wickedness. When the lamb's in your house, he will cause you to go through and purge out everything in your house that does not belong there. Somebody say amen. Things that you don't need anymore. Things that you, don't, you should not do anymore. He's purging it out. He's getting rid of it. He's going to take you through life. And he's going to say, see that over there? Remember how you used to do that over there? You're not going to do that no more, are you? I'm going to remove that out of your life. That's going to be painful. But I'm going to take it out. That's what God says to us. Neither the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's talking about this book right here. Luke 12, 1, in the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod upon one another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware ye the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Let's get rid of the leaven of looking at everybody else's wrongdoings and glossing over our own. Looking at what somebody... The, the Facebook police, that's who I'm talking about. The Facebook cops who watch everything that everybody posts, and if you say one word that they think is out of line, boom, they're going to get you. You post a picture, somebody deems that inappropriate, boom, they're going to get you. You worry about your sins purging them out of your house while the lamb is there because the lamb's going to abide in a clean house and no other so watch out hypocrites amen watch out you hypocrites it's a lamb to remember what is this written on the front of our communion table It's been there, that communion table's been there as long as I've been here, longer. We've never changed it, and don't plan on it. In Exodus 12, 25, this is what he says, And it shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that you shall keep this service. And it, and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service, that ye shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshiped. In other words, for years to come, Moses and his generation were the ones who saw the first Passover. But after that, they knew that their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren were going to come along who had not seen God's deliverance of the people out of Egypt. And they were going to ask, Grandpa, why is it that we're sitting here eating lamb? Why are we having to stand on our feet? 
Why is it we have to drink these bitter herbs? Why do we have to do this, Grandpa? And Grandpa will say to his grandchild or his great-grandchild, Son, when I was a little boy, God delivered us out of Egypt. We were in bondage. We were in slavery. We were, had, had cruel taskmasters over us with whips beating us every day. We had to work and labor every day. And we didn't have enough food. And God delivered us from that. He said, don't ever forget what He's done for you. Luke chapter 22, verse 19, He took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. John chapter 14, verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And I'm going to tell you something. God is the one who will make you remember. The Holy Ghost will come down and He'll cause you to remember. He'll cause you to remember the pit that God saved you out of. When you start looking down at others who are down in that pit. God, I'll tell you what, God's been doing that with me. The last, man, several months. God's not let me forget the pit that he dug me out of. And I'm glad for that. And then when you got the lamb in your house, you'll have the same spirit that the lamb will have. Revelation chapter 5, turn there. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. That book is, what you hold in your hand is a representation of that very book. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I want you to look at me for a second. We're living in days, we don't know when this thing's going to end, but I'm, I've about had enough of it. But I'll tell you this, I realize that just me saying I've had enough of it does not make it all go away. I can't put cars back on the streets, I can't put people back to work, I can't open up all the stores and churches again, I can't open up all of those places that people go to, I can't do that, I have no power against this. And I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. Or the next day. Or the next day. I don't know how many more people are going to die. I don't know if this thing's ever going to go away. So to me, the days ahead of us are sealed up. And I keep, I keep repeating the same thing over again. Stop looking to the internet for answers. Look rather to the book for answers. Look to the book. God knows where this is going, and surely the Lord doeth nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. That's what he said. I'm going to preach that this afternoon. And what I'm saying to you is, the things that we don't know that are sealed up to us, the Lamb being present with us has the ability to unseal those things and open up the book to our understanding. Just like he did with Jeremiah. When Jeremiah was in Babylon, I can picture him having a bad day going, boy, I yearn for home. Are we ever going to get to go back home? That was 70 years, not three months. 70 years they were gone. And God opened up his understanding. He read in the book of no it was Daniel I had it backwards Daniel was in Babylonian captivity he opened the book of Jeremiah and read in Jeremiah that they were going to be there 70 years and he said hallelujah I know we're not going to be here forever there's a day coming when we're going to get to go back home I can't wait that was the lamb opening up his understanding because he understood by the book that it was to be a certain date and it's going to be no more Verse 4, John said, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Notice that he's called the lion. So if I'm John, I'm going to turn around, I'm going to be looking for a lion. But what does he see? A lamb. I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. As it had been slain. Like in the Passover. Here's the Passover right here. 
stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And the seven spirits of God, you know this, Isaiah chapter 11, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding. God's going to be with us, Roy. He's not left you. He's not walked away. You've got the lamb in your house with you. And if you'll ask God, he'll open, the lamb will open up the book for you to understand what God's doing in your life right now. And I say that to everybody. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Where does our faith come from? The Word of God. He's the author of the Word of God. So if you have the lamb in your house, you can ask him while he's there, open my understanding of what's going on in this world. Unseal this for me. Give me the seven spirits so I can understand your word and know Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, Isaiah said. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee. How old was Jesus when he was the lamb slain? 33, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I don't know when this thing's going to end. I don't know how terrible it's going to get. I don't know what's behind it all. But I know the man that does. I know the lamb that can open up our understanding of what's going on in this world to help us get through this thing because I want to get through this thing amen because you know why because I want to get ready for the next one which could be worse I hate to say that but that's the time we live in I'm out of notes I want you to bow your head we're gonna pray just have an old prayer time this morning. Whoever's listening to me out there, you need a lamb in your house. You need the lamb. Maybe the lamb will save you from this virus. Maybe the lamb will do what he's done with some already. Save them so that they need not worry about getting any virus ever again because they're in heaven. When saints die, my friends and brothers and sisters, they don't really die. They're living now forever, which is what we all wanted to begin with. But it takes death to get there. And we don't ever have to worry about walking death alone because we have someone who goes before us like the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We have Jesus who's already walked the way of death and knows how it is and knows the way to go so that when we walk that way, we need not fear. Ask God this morning, to take away your fears. Ask God this morning to purge the leaven out of your house. All that rotten junk that you've got left over from a life of sin, maybe it's time while God's got your attention, maybe it's time to purge that stuff out. Maybe it's time to get your Bible out and read it, to eat the flesh of Christ, the bread, the manna that God sent down from heaven. Maybe it's time for that for you. Father in heaven, come to you today. And Lord, I don't, I don't have a clue who I'm preaching to. And Father, obviously, you wanted it that way. Obviously, you did. Because it happened. And so everything's in your hand, Father, and I trust you. Father, my heart goes out to those who've lost loved ones.
because of this terrible virus. My heart goes out to people, Lord, who are just living in constant fear over what could be happening next. I pray, dear God, that you would set your love on those people, Lord, who are in fear and take away their fear from them. Give them a sound mind. Give them love. Give them peace and understanding. Again, Father, purge out all the old rot that we brought into this life living for you. Purge that stuff out. Get out the leaven of false doctrine. Get out the leaven of sin, hypocrisy. Purge those things out of us. But we thank you, Father, for the blood. Because the destroyer is out there looking for another house to destroy. Father, I understand it when I hear that domestic violence right now is on the rise in this country. I understand it. People hate one another. It's because they don't have a lamb in their house. They need a lamb to save them, to show them what love is like. Show them what dwelling together in love is like. They need a lamb. Give them of yourself, Jesus, to all those who need it, people like me. Let the lamb live in our house. Keep us from the destroyer. We ask you these things. We ask your blessings upon your people all over the world. We ask your blessings on your word. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.